Welcome to Showbiz Chicago, the podcast. Well, I'm at a new location. I've actually never even been here. My office is right down the street. I am with Stephen Burns, guru, can I call you guru, <laughs> of the Fulcrum Point New Music Project, who has a very interesting um, performance coming up April 23rd at the Harris Theater. They are showing the film Altered States, one of my favorites, with a 75-piece orchestra live, live. So this is going to be an amazing night. It is an extraordinary event. It's never happened before with a live orchestra. Uh, we are playing from the original uh, recording um, scores and parts that were done in New York. Uh, that's gosh, incredible. that had been um, 1980. Yes. Yeah. So what is your fascination first with altered states? Well, first of all, I think it's really interesting to kind of explore the mind. I'm a, I'm a, a meditator and, a, and, a, and a, a, a real fan of exploring what is human consciousness? What is the human state of mind? And and uh, where do we come from? Where are we going? And mm -hmm. so, this is a sci-fi classic, classic. Uh, that also has a certain romantic twist to it that really explores not only the, the kind of the birth of mankind is how they phrase it, but but also what are our priorities? You That's know, right. It's, it is That's right. you know is is our knowledge is our uh, investigation of the the greatest frontier, which is probably the the inner workings of the mind, is that really more important than love? And, and it's done in a way that only Ken Russell <laughs> can do it, the film's director, who I, I think, you know, uh, my point of reference for him is always Tommy, mm -hmm. the musical, because I always equate that with Alton States, the way it was filmed, and because it became really a, a psychedelic mind screw. If you will, yeah, and so is Alter Stage, it's which a, goes it's into an absolute trip schizophrenia. And yeah, it's not so much schizophrenia as it is hallucinations. I mean, yeah. these are really magic right. mushroom induced yeah. uh, hallucinations, and the hallucinations that that Dr. Mm -hmm. Jessup has earlier in his life. Hard to say if they're schizophrenia or, or if it's you know visions of, of right. an imaginary child. I was actually child. talking about like Tommy at the time, but yes, oh, yeah. yes, but yes, right, absolutely. <clears throat> and for people that haven't seen Altered States, and, and it is good to see it high. <laughs> Yeah, no, I remember 1980, barely. Right? But, um, yeah, it's about they, like, this psychiatrist, I guess he would be, right? And that, like, puts, isolates everybody in these tanks. Well, this so was just one series of, of experiments that he did. It's right. kind of based on the work that Timothy Leary was doing in, in Harvard in the 1960s. Um, and he's he's really more of a social anthropologist than he is a, a, a psychiatrist. psychiatrist right. And he's really trying to understand how the mind works. And and one of the things that he did was to was to explore uh, an indigenous tribe of Mexico hmm. that had this rite where they would uh, induce a soup based on some some potent magic mushroom. And in the words of the of the chief of the tribe, you would begin to find the origin of your soul. Right. And um, so he takes this trip over and over and over again, and, and, and to intensify it, he takes it while in an isolation tank and goes through a whole series of kind of genetic retrograde uh, permutations. And, and the movie is actually um, very theatrical, just the way it's filmed. Oh, a lot absolutely. because of the author and because he was a playwright as well. But it, but it is very big and theatrical. And I'm just wondering, like, just... From your point of view, how do you get a movie like that financed? Because that would never even happen in today's day and age, you know. Or just yeah, I think it's you know the, the probably Warner Brothers believed in um, in Ken Russell right, absolutely at that point. right because it was point, his and it was right on the heels of Tommy right uh, because before that Ken Russell was doing a bunch of biopics from mm -hmm. BBC and they were also quite surreal in and and quite imaginative. Um, and he also was doing some very socially provocative um, uh, films. One was called The Ghost. Another one had to do with all kinds of um, criticism of the Catholic Church. He was in deep hot water through most of his career. Yep. And this one has a bit of that in it, but it has more to do with um, really the, the time period of the 1960s and, and early 70s of free love, free drugs, lots of rock and roll. And in this case, the music the that's composed... Yeah, the age of Aquarius. <laughs> The music is composed by John Corleano, who mm -hmm. will be here yes. for next week. 75th birthday. Yeah, we're celebrating 75 years of incredible creativity as a composer, as a teacher, as a, as a film scorer. And in this piece, he really, he really uses this entire compositional language. It goes everywhere from what he would write for a string quartet 
or for a symphony orchestra to what he's written for concerti for great virtuosi, uh, the Ghost of Versailles um, opera opera writing that he's done, and 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 then just some brilliantly Im imaginative use of abstract expressionism, where he asked the orchestra to make these sounds that they'd never made before. They're, 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 the strings are bowing on the end pins and on the on the inside of the bridges and. And, and tapping and, and scraping and doing all kinds of things. The, uh, the woodwinds are, are asked to play at a different angle and a different sonority that creates these multiphonics. And, the, and the, the whole piece is brought together as a kind of like a tapestry, a wow. tapestry of, of um, extended techniques and what he, he calls um, movement sonorities. So a, a very, his way of explaining it is this very simple movement sonority is a trill where a composer would write TR over a note, mm -hmm. and a player would play eight very fast alternate notes in between. So he's created a, a whole a structure of several of those kind of things that are based on glissandi, based on alternate notes, based on improvisations, based on um, basically pushing the instrument beyond its boundaries until it's practically breaking. So how long ago did you start planning this project, and what has it been like getting it up? Which it is coming is, next week. Right? You know, well, it's been a dream of mine for for the thirty some odd years that it's been since I saw the film the first time. Um, and then over the last fifteen years, we've been doing film music concerts as a way of introducing the general population to great abstract music in um, films that they've already seen. So we've done. Um, there Will Be Blood, mm -hmm. which is as, as a beautiful uh, soundtrack by Johnny Greenwood of, of Radiohead, and it's completely out there and, and bizarre. We've also done, um, uh, let's see, Shutter Island was another one we've done. We've done some movies that Aaron Copeland wrote music to, that T uh, Toru Takamitsu has done. So this particular project started about a year and a half ago as we were planning for our 15th anniversary season. I wanted to be, what would be the the ultimate film extravaganza, and I said, well, Altered States, right. it has to be it. So we started looking into it, and, and my uh, business partner, executive director, Sophia Wong Bacho, uh, approached Warner Brothers and negotiated... I sense her somewhere. Them. Well, she's been uh, my, <laughs> my right arm for the last six years, and, and uh, this was an incredible feat of negotiation because, of, of course... No, very few movie studios want to look backwards. Right. They just want the next new thing, and even if it's a combination of what had just been or what, you know, everybody wants to know, uh, you know, that the 30-second elevator pitch, which is, of course, give me a film. It's got to be Rocky meets Star Wars. Meets, <laughs> right. You know, Where's John Williams' score and all this? Exactly. Yeah. And, and they, you know, they always want something that is familiar and yet yeah. not repeated from the past. This is a work that really, really captures that, that kind of experimental period in the 1970s and early 80s. And so we convinced them. So, Sophia and what is that ne negotiation that. process like? So, when, when you're approaching a studio, mm -hmm. um, like, what is the pitch and what is usually the response? Because you're acquiring the rights for. You know, a production. Right. You know, where you have the composer. So, well, so the, the the basically you go and tell them what the the purpose of this. This is to celebrate a great American Academy winning, Emmy winning, Grammy winning winning composer, mm -hmm. and um, and a work that was one of their um, most important films at Warner Brothers. And we're doing this whole week of of celebrating John Corleone's life, and this will be the really the the major event of the week and John Corleone will be there, um, we assured them that we could do it. We gave them our track record of doing these kind of things, and um, they came back to us with a, with a, a counter offer that was kind of ab absurd given our, our budget. I mean, they're, uh, they're used to dealing in yes. at least yes. seven... Yeah. My lawyer side not, comes out with things like that, so I know exactly what you're talking no, they're, about. They're used That's to dealing in, in, in budgets of, of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Uh, we're we're they don't understand we're that. dealing in tens <laughs> of thousands, and hundreds of right, thousands. Right. So it's not the same. We're not it's just thinking on the same level. But they back and you know Sophia went back and forth, and and we were able to uh, to work with them and come to an agreement. And um, so this is a one shot deal. This right. will happen only once, and it's on April twenty third at the Harris Theater. 
and then we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I would love to convince other orchestras to do it because I think it's a it's great music and it's a beautiful film and it's a worthwhile project. And how do you pick your mus musicians? Uh, we pick the best musicians that are in Chicago. Some of them play with the Chicago Symphony. Or a lot of them are there in the Lyric Opera or they're teaching at the local universities, Northwestern, DePaul, um, as well as coming in from Michigan and, and Wisconsin. So these are the, be the best music musicians for playing contemporary art music well, that exist. And where do you get the score from? Like, who's, who's the keeper of the scores for, for music, for um, well, movie Warner, music? Warner Brothers has a department of keep, you know, is keeping wow. the scores. In fact, the scores were found in Kansas City, Missouri. Really? And then shipped back to L.A. and photocopied and then sent to us. And the interesting process was that, of course, they recorded probably two and a half times as much music as sure. they needed. Sure. They sent us everything. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not recorded, but all the sure, sheet but music. All the and so school. I spent the, my winter uh, <laughs> from January, February, and March basically taking the score and following wow. the, the movie and editing it down to the nth degree. Now that's and then incredible. And taking all the parts and doing the exact same thing. Wow. And then along the process, notating within the score, because they had some cues, like, you know, ape runs across the street <laughs> or, or whatever, exactly. or, you know, the <laughs> explosion. But in order to really sync it with the score, I'm basically notating each bar of the score with the action that's on the film, and I'm following the film. And when the time comes for the ape to hit the guard with the stick, I sync it up with the crunch. How incredible is that, though? They, they, you're almost redoing the whole we thing from scratch. It is not from scratch, because John didn't have to write it again. <laughs> well, that, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. So, uh, tell me about you. My background is as a, as a trumpeter and a composer and a conductor. I've been touring internationally for, oh gosh, over 30 years. How'd you um, end up in Chicago? I ended up in Chicago in 1997, 96, 97. I was doing some projects in New York. Um, Susan Lippman, who was the director of Performing Arts Chicago at the time, mm -hmm. was, was in New York and was interested in some of the experimental things that I was doing. And at that same time, I was on the faculty at Indiana University, so I was pretty close to Chicago. So she suggested that I become an artist in residence with Performing Arts Chicago kind of like a curator of contemporary music, and program, the first year we did three programs. You're like the Michael Feinstein of contemporary music. You could say that, or it could be, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's more like uh, somebody who is in the art world who needs to put together three shows at the Art Institute or the Museum of Contemporary Art. And so there's a lot of research that goes in, it goes into it. And then at the time, Chicago was, was really famous for having Pierre Boulez at the Chicago Symphony, Ralph Shapey at University of Chicago. And it was all very academic mm -hmm. um, and, and very kind of narrow spectrum of, of new art music, which was great stuff, you know, it's, but it was very narrow. It, it left out Philip Glass and Steve Reich and all the minimalists and the down, what we call the downtown uh, composers. And it left out the neoclassical and the neo-romantic composers that were coming out of, of, of Boston and New York at the time. And so my idea at the time was to really create a series of concerts that would introduce people to the complete spectrum of new art music. Hmm. And we would do it by creating powerful contexts. And sometimes the context was um, a concert dance party where we would have you know, drinks and hors d'oeuvres and a one hour and 15 minute first half that was music inspired by rock and roll, or funk, or blues, or jazz. And then the second half we would have blues, rock and roll, funk, whatever. Um, and that expanded into world music, and so we, I started collaborating with um, musicians from West Africa, from Indonesia, from um, China, and we created this whole um, concept of uh, where does the Western classical music tradition intersect with other traditional musics from around the world. And, and, and with the original premise that one is not greater than the other, but just a no, completely of new of way not. of looking at the world, even though Chinese traditional music is, is, is ancient and Indian classical music is ancient. And all these traditions have, have go back for generations, if not uh, centuries, and perhaps millennia. 
so that's the that was that's the original premise. And then, so what else could we do? You know, what how, what else gets people interested? So we would have music with dinner parties. I did music at various restaurants or at the Kendall College, mm -hmm. and um, or we would do things with. And so film was one of them. You pair it with great film and have a concert of film music with. And at the time, we would just do excerpts. We would do like the action excerpts from various films. We would take. Psycho and break it down into its components, and right. and and it was a, it was a great challenge to find ten fifteen minutes of music here and there that didn't have words. That's true. Well, you never really think you about that, really except for like big that. action films or something. It gets it's tricky because, of yeah. course, what it is is what Warner Brothers was so generous in doing because they they cut us a great deal and they did this they created this digital version of the film um, that is with sound effects and dialogue only. So they cut out all the... So they left out all the orchestral music. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of places where the or orchestra bleeds through, but they, because of the nature of the abstract expressionism, it blends perfectly with the orchestra when it's live. Wow. So it's really a lot of fun. So when you're rehearsing, Stephen, um, with the orchestra, I don't know mm -hmm. how many rehearsals you get to have because mm -hmm. of the size of it. You're rehearsing for a week. Uh, and yeah. So you, um, what is that like process like with the orchestra when they're... And I'm, I'm sure you're showing the film behind you. Is that how it works? Right. It, or the, in front of me, because it's, right. it, you know, I have to are be you, able to see you, it. They right. don't really have to be right. able to so see it. So you're conducting. So I'm conducting. And basically the process okay. is we have a couple of rehearsals where the musicians are familiarized with these extended techniques that Corleano came up with. And then we focus on the, the there are about 10 movements that are high action and really, 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 really key um, coordination problems. And we focus on those. There are others where it's basic underscoring, and you'll just have a, a, some, right. some tremolos or some chords or some simple melodies that accompany the film. We don't really need to rehearse that. That will just un, you know, kind of un, unravel by itself, or it will roll on by itself. So we'll be focusing really on the ones where uh, because the, of the notation, which is not in straight time, mm -hmm. and everything is done by capturing the, the action, I will have the screen in front of me and be working, and the musicians will be, they're going to be developing their trust in me, the conductor. And that's, that's the process of any rehearsal process, whether it is a Brahms symphony or a Stravinsky you know, Rite of Spring. And the, trusting the, the, the conductor the beginning, always. Right. The Absolutely. beginning is is a really establishing a rapport between the conductor and the orchestra, and then tackling the major issues, the major problems, and then coordination and execution come in in the last couple of rehearsals. So tell me about Fulcrum Point. Fulcrum Point is now celebrating 15 years. Nice. Um, Congratulations. And it, so in the, it, it, we began under the umbrella of Performing Arts Chicago. Okay. And, uh, and in the beginning we did three concerts, and then it grew by about a concert every year over, over about a decade and then we hovered around a half a dozen concerts and then we begin we've begun to add um, educational programs in addition to the concerts that we do at the Harris Theater because it's a not-for-profit right it's a non-profit organization we rely upon gr grants from governments from foundations and donations from individuals and and their family foundations and so um, we are in a relatively small non-for-profit that um, we work out of downtown Chicago mm -hmm. and have toured regionally and have been investigating going internationally with some of the projects that we've <coughs> that we've developed over the years, operas and, and, and some chamber works. Uh, we have a wonderful educational program called Soundtracks where we go into the schools and we bring new music and world music into the fourth and fifth graders. Oh, wow. Um, and using PowerPoint of maps and, and videos and... And, and photos were able to take kids on a, on a trip around the world. It goes across China, India, Middle East, Africa, Latin American countries. And we bring three musicians to the, to the, to the school and they give an entire spiel on the, the culture, the architecture, the, ar the, uh, wow. the, all the richness in terms of the, the various cultures and the deserts, the rivers, the topography, the whole thing. Um, and this is accompanied by a, a study guide with DVDs and, and books so that the kids can learn all the, all the names of the instruments, all the names of the cities and the, and the various things. So we kind of coordinate with both their music program, which a lot of schools in Chicago don't have any, 
and their social <laughs> studies and their yeah, creative content. writing yeah. projects. So, they, so they'll write um, essays about what they're hearing, and they'll and they'll take tests on getting to know what the instruments are or the, you know, what the largest, you know, what the the the, the largest um, Adobe structure in the world is. Wow, that's incredible! You know, though, the, the great mosque at Jenne in in West Africa. So they'll know these things, and they'll see. You know, they get to know the, the, the Taj Mahal, the Great Wall of China, um, the, the Forbidden City. They, they get to explore the rainforests of South America and the, and the wonderful different cultures of whether it's gypsy culture or, or traditional Middle Eastern cultures. It's a, it's, a real, um, it's a real tour de force thing. And then I come in or, or my, our guest uh, resident composers will go and talk about what it's like to, to write the music and to create new music and what the definition of new music is and how it functions in our life. So in this scenario of Altered States, it functions as a soundtrack. In other situations, it functions as a way of healing, or it's a way of worshipping, or it's a way of entertaining, or it's a way of stimulating your imagination to awaken your, your, your essential human goodness. Isn't it amazing the access you're giving to these students, though? I mean, you and I grew up, I think we're relatively the same age. We grew up when schools had all these programs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, where would you and I be without, you yeah. know, my high school music teacher, God bless him, I mean, introduced me to musical theater, which right. is my life. I mean, what you're bringing to the schools is so important. And that's what's happening now, I think, though, Stephen, is like organizations like yours, the schools begin to rely on to bring in that cross-culturalism to their school. Right, and there are, there are organizations like Polk Brothers mm -hmm. Foundation who yep. are visionaries who, who mm -hmm. say, we want you to do these things. Absolutely. And so they funded part of our, 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 our work, and then others have come to say, well, yes, what well, we want it more hands-on. So we have Soundtracks Plus, where the slightly older kids learn to play the instruments, learn to sing the songs, and do the dances so of, of the, these various cultures. And then we have a great big festival at the end of the year, and they give a performance. Sometimes they perform in our concerts. Uh, back in October, we had um, a whole we had a wonderful school come and do um, the uh, flamenco dancing on, on our on our Latin concert in the fall. In um, in March, we had the, the Woodlawn Elementary Community School um, come and, and do African drumming on our program at the Logan Art Center. Mm -hmm. That was an all Afrobeats program, which was really cool. How far ahead do you plan? Not, not you plan a year, like year and a half in advance. Uh, some things take longer. We're, in a, we're working on a two-year project with the MacArthur Foundation, bringing um, an Indian composer, Param Veer, to Chicago with a soloist from India whose name is Shumik Datta, and we're creating a new form that fuses Indian classical music with Western wow. contemporary music. And so they'll be here in the fall. We'll be improvising together, creating a, a, a communal language. Then the composer will will go back to the studio, write some sketches, and then our me and and, and my musicians, I will take um, the, the part of the ensemble to London, and we'll work there intensively in the fourteen. And then the end of two thousand fourteen, it all should be done, and we'll have a we'll have a new new genre. That is just it's really exciting. Oh my God, yeah, it's super Stephen! Exciting. Yeah, this is like I never knew. I, I mean, the important, important. You know how important that is. How revolutionary that is. Well, I, I'm glad I you mean, appreciate it. On. I think it is. It is. You know, I have goosebumps you think, when you talk about. It. Well, when you think about the kind of, of things that that uh, that Bach did and Beethoven and Stravinsky and Shostakovich, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's old, old no. classical stuff. No. But at the time, they were pushing the envelope. And and uh, you know the Thomas Kirche in Leipzig is was just a very small place. It wasn't the big, it wasn't the big uh, the big city. Um, and later on, I think it's become more of an urban art. Yes. Yeah. And I actually just did a, a podcast about a month ago with the new director over at um, Chicago Opera, mm -hmm. um, Andreas, mm -hmm. and he he was saying the same thing. It's like um, a lot of this gets lost with all the composers, especially in opera and back then about how personal that stuff was. It, you know, you all have the grandness of it, but just how simple and the context it was all in, mm -hmm. which is, I think, something you were just referring to. And I think that's, that's so important when you're talking about Shostakovich and, and all the great composers. And I think the other thing that people... Is that at a time certain. Yeah, what people don't realize also is how much it, 
it resonates and percolates and then flows into other art forms. Yes. So I mentioned Johnny Greenwood before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? So Johnny Greenwood was a great rock and roll musician, completely trained as a classical violist, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing if you look back at what the Beatles did. You know, of they course. were great rock and roll musicians, and the producers, have, you know, came in and said, well, you, I think it'd be really interesting if you put a brass band in here, or perhaps a little piccolo over here, or you need some strings to accompany this. This was completely never done before those times, but it was the it was the influence of the classical music yeah. on those people that um, allowed them to push their imaginations to a place where no other pop musician had gone. Right. I think Paul Simon and Peter Gabriel, what they exactly. even brought in. And it, and it continues that way. It continues that way because it's basically, it takes just a, a few people pushing a few yep. boulders yep. Up, the, up the mountain. At a certain point, you get to the top and it pushes over and it starts an avalanche of a whole bunch of other things. I mean, some people call it the hundredth monkey principle. I think it more it's more like it just singular organizations like Fulcrum Point or singular artists who come together with a common goal of creating art, something new, yeah. art, something creating something out of nothing. And of course, you can have politicians and 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 people in society saying, "Oh, you know, it's it's an elitist thing," or it is. Um, you know, it is, it's just frivolous and it's nonsense and it's not going to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. But what it does for human nature and what it does for society at large is that, it, it first of all, it, they are the catalyst. Absolutely. The artists are the catalyst for great change. Yep. always have been. And it always has been. And then the avalanche that comes after that, people just take for granted because there's so much momentum and mm -hmm. so much enthusiasm. But the amount of work that gets done by by artists, like you say, sitting alone in a studio somewhere, or arts organizations uh, doing a labor of love, uh, it's, you know, it, it's really impressive. Now, so I, 1997, 1998, we started Fulcrum Point here in Chicago, and back then there were probably five groups doing new music. Now there are over 25. There's an organization called uh, New Music Chicago that basically, New Music Chicago coordinates all the efforts of all these groups and um, it makes it possible that people can, first of all, make a living playing new music in Chicago. And second of all, the audience, the, the whole community of Chicago can really experience the complete spectrum of what's going on out there. And there's some exciting, exciting new things going on all around Chicago, and this is one of them. Social media must have helped out a lot for something like this, because I, I, marketing something like this traditionally must have been very, very difficult. It's very difficult. It's very expensive. You know, very people, expensive. People have, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, most people don't go and, and take out an ad in the newspaper or run run. What, a, new, what are newspapers? What are newspapers? <laughs> or run an ad on on the radio or or mm -hmm. television, right? I mean, the cost of that is just prohibitive. Right. It's true. So, but but now at least you get to target people that really can appreciate it too, and then reach a wider mass at that. Yeah, I hopefully they they uh, will will catch wind of it and yeah. and how is fundraising I'm sure it's fundraising is a, is a battle and a challenge uh, sure for everybody and and we are you know we are at the right there within in in the mix so do you have um, aside from you know donation stuff do you host a big gala or we like, have done did, galas in the past and we're you know a lot of times people are really bored with galas you're not kidding yeah <laughs> especially so when you have like we're trying to, in a row. We're, we're trying to exactly most something have new. To, we're trying to figure out a, a new dynamic a new way of doing it and we've got some ideas that uh, hopefully will will pay off yeah. Well, in closing, um, if you want to add anything at the end, but who were some of your biggest influences and mentors growing up? I've been asking the last, like, six months, my, my guests. Let's you know, see. Who, who affect you in your everyday life? Oh, boy, in my everyday life. Um, well, musically, John Corleano actually has been a, a, a great advisor of mine for decades, from the very beginning. And Leonard Bernstein was, was one of hmm. my teachers in high school and college. So that was no. that was oh. he was a huge you and I are going to be doing like an hour after. <laughs> <laughs> oh he my was God. he was a he you know because he was such a visionary at a time when there was such a separation between classical music and popular music. Absolutely, um, groundbreaking. He, just didn't he have was everything that everything. man touched. Yeah, so he was a he was a brilliant brilliant mind and a giant heart. So that was um, he was a huge influence. And to be honest with you, just, you know, coming, I came from a very typical suburban Boston family, you know, 
five kids. Mom, you know, to, ran the right. ran the, the the military base. And, really? <laughs> no. Well, just oh, the five there kids. you go. Okay, that's gotta I mean, say. And my dad. So well. they were, you know, they really really stressed a well-rounded life. Sports, music, art, education, 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 and having a good sense of self and 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 um, in spirituality. So all these things come into all these things come together at the fulcrum point. That's the nature of this of the title of our organization is that it it is this place where all the forces of of nature come to come to bear, and it can be the the force of the the future, the past on the future. It can be the force of, of improvisation on composition, it can be the force of popular culture on something that's more traditional. There's all kinds of ways of looking at that, and so what, the, the context that we create, the fulcrum points that we create, are when we find something like, what do you do at Christmas time with, with avant-garde contemporary music? Oh. But find common ground, find the, the fulcrum point, and Christmas time or holiday time, Hanukkah, New Year's is about appreciation. It's about peace on earth and goodwill to men. So we've had a series of, of concerts based on peace. Right. And that evolved and grew over the years. And then when 9-11 happened, it shifted from the holiday season to 9-11 because it's a, it's a great symbol of, of, um, of, of violent atrocity. Yes. And, they, and these continue to happen. As and they, a shift. It's a shift. It is a, it is a, it is a uh, dynamic shift. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, these things continue to happen as we as we as just we are. As yes. we just recognized. And 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 unfortunately, we haven't reached that that edge of the mountaintop with our with our with our little boulder to get the avalanche to go away from violence and away from atrocities of of uh, that scale. So we continue, but we also want to enlighten people with education. So we use literature, poetry, art. Um, we also feel that there's there's you know incredible richness in film, in dance, oh God, absolutely. Um, Dark. food, yeah. yes, yes, and um, and just finding ways of bringing people food. together. Because we were talking about chemicality, like earlier, yeah. and going into that, just you know, talking about cross culturalism. No more do you find it there than exactly. Than, yeah, and so there's, and that's something that's happening. We've done performances up at Space. We're I looking into space. City Winery. There's all kinds of yep. great places that we want to do where you can have a pizza and a, and a beer and, yeah. and uh, listen to some really right. intense music. And open up the discussion. And open up the discussion. We always have that afterwards as well. So oh. yeah, on the 23rd, John Corleone will be uh, answering questions after the performance and speaking with the Columbia College uh, Film Department, both in the filmmakers and the film um, composers. So they're one of our, our partners uh, for this pr production. So. And, and fantastic. Uh, you know, I just moved to the South Loop. I mm -hmm. was living up in River North. Boy, that school has just taken over <laughs> everything down there. Yeah, well, yeah. And an, an incredible beacon in, a, yeah. in our city for the arts. It's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful partner of ours. We really appreciate their support. Well, thank you. Thank and you and you we're going to be continuing this discussion. <laughs> in the Anytime. Future. Thank you.